Good afternoon, Vanakam, Namaskaram. I welcome everyone to this virtual event that we're calling Conversation on One Face, Many Voices, National Identity in American Studies. My name is Molik Burkana. I am the Cultural Affairs Officer at the US Consulate General in Chennai. Although right at the moment, I'm in the United States and by the magic of technology, we can all be connected for this virtual event. I'm very grateful that we have with us three experts from South India. I will introduce their names, positions, and institutions, and then say a few words of introduction. Um, we're very happy today to be joined by Dr. Gita Ganga, the Associate Professor from the Department of English at DG Vaishnav College in Chennai. We're also very pleased to welcome Dr. R. Alagarasan, who is a professor from the Department of English at the University of Madras in Chennai. And reaching out to Koen Bator, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Manju Kumari K., who is an assistant professor from the Department of English at Nirmala College in Koen Bator. This event is being streamed live on Facebook, so we hope we have a lot of people tuning in. There is the opportunity to uh, present questions to our panelists today, so we'll hope that our listeners and viewers following along will submit any questions. We'll take some time toward the end of the program to consider questions. And before I turn it over to our panelists, I just wanted to share a few words here. Um, first, this program is one of a series of virtual events that we're organizing from the US Consulate in Chennai. You know, these are, it goes without saying, these are unusual times. Probably in any of our lifetimes, we've never faced a situation like this where so much is happening remotely and so much um, disruption with meeting in person and being able to do events face to face. But in the face of those challenges, the consulate has adapted and adopted. And we've done a series of virtual programs, about one per week or more, where we reach out to audiences, not only in South India, but really literally around the world with what we hope are a variety of interesting and intriguing programs. And that includes this one today. Again, the topic is on one face, many voices, national identity in American studies. So we'll be approaching this topic through a variety of lenses, a variety of paths, including literature and other cultural studies. You know, I first came to India back in 1995 as a young man, and I was struck by the diversity of India. You have every religion, you have so many official languages, so many types of food and architecture and such a rich, beautiful history that as an American diplomat, I'm very honored to represent my country in India, which is such a special place. Like India, of course, the United States is a very diverse country. We're a country um, composed of people from around the world. I know that there's a neighborhood in Queens, New York, where you can go and you can find any kind of food, any kind of language spoken there. And in my own case too, I am the descendant of an immigrant. My great grandfather came to the United States in 1906 from Austria. So, we cherish that diversity and those, um, you know, the strength of how the diversity builds into our society. And it's very interesting in that context to look at the issue of national identity. I'd like to share a quote from Mina Alexander, who is an Indian American poet. Um, she was from Kerala, lived a lot of her life in New York. She said, as a writer, you carry the world inside you. I carry a map of Kerala in my heart. I walk in Central Park, see the trees and find inspiration for a story or a poem set in Kerala. I think that's kind of a nice quote to set the tone here. I just want to say a word also about our American Center in Chennai. I hope you'll all have the chance to visit when we open again physically. We want to make sure that we do it in good time that we do it in a safe way that protects our patrons. But when you do have the chance to visit our American Center, please know that we have one of the largest collections of American studies materials in South Asia. 
We offer a, a wide variety of programs at our American Center, English language workshops, working with entrepreneurs, higher education. Uh, we have uh, film screenings, occasional music events. So that's just a little bit about our American Center and I would encourage you to visit and to consider taking membership if you're not already a member. So as I mentioned, we have three expert panelists with us today from throughout South India. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started here. Let me um, introduce first uh, Dr. Gita Ganga. And she's going to speak, I understand, about perhaps contestations of space and identity, perhaps with particular regard to the African-American experience, which is one of her specialties. So I thank all the panelists once again for joining us. And let's go ahead and get started with Dr. Gita Ganga. Over to you, Dr. Gita. Thank you, Malik Barkana. And uh, it's an honor sharing space with uh, Malik, whom I've seen is an individual who tries to understand Indian culture in a very sensitive way and to share space with Professor Aya Galpan from the University of Madras, where I have spent a formidable number of years as a researcher, and I've listened to him theorizing, and uh, with Dr. Manju, with whom we just connected on the virtual platform for the first time. Uh, thank you to the US Consulate, uh, uh, to Mr. Prem, uh, director, and uh, his team for you know, having made this arrangement. Thank you so much. Uh, my approach to American literature is through actually African literature because I studied African literature and to be more specific, I was always locked up in the Horn of Africa, Somalia to be, to be more precise. Uh, and also writing from the Af uh, di African diaspora. Africa's diaspora, particularly in the United States. And uh, some of these diasporic writers were straddling ocean nationalities. And uh, it, it, it was, uh, you know, and that gave me a chance uh, to also understand uh, American contemporary society, culture, politics. Uh, I'm not a specialist in American studies, as Malik said, but I would like to share some of my thoughts uh, as a student of literature, we had courses in American literature. My brief sojourn to the United States as a Fulbright researcher and, uh, you know, travels to conferences where I met up with Afrikaners and uh, reading and, uh, you know, uh, looking at the media, music, etc. It is rightful to take off. I would like to take off uh, from what happened in late May the death of George Floyd, the African-American, 46-year-old African-American who choked on three words, I can't breathe. And uh, I mean, paradoxically, our, uh, uh, the title of our program is uh, Many Voices. And uh, George Floyd was muted. So that, from that take-off point, I was thinking that, may, that made me you know, think of uh, celebrated poet Maya Angelou and her metaphorical caged bird, uh, whose hands, you know, uh, whose feet were clipped and uh, wings, I mean, sorry, her hand, feet were tied and wings were clipped. And uh, the bird was trying to open its throat to sing, but in vain, because its voice was lost in the distant hills. Uh, so this, and I was also thinking, you know, my thoughts went to Oprah Winfrey, who also has talked about uh, how she was, you know, raised at a very young age. And uh, one of her biographers talks about uh, a small uh, episode in her life where they say she lost her voice after that trauma. So voice, voice is today's predominantly, you know, a uh, recurring theme that uh, uh, both panelists, the other two panelists are also gonna talk about. And in the African-American context, uh, we know that uh, there have been a lot of narrative voices both in literature and in music, jazz, blues, or the gospel music, the call and response. And uh, most of these voices have negotiated, contested, interrogated uh, their identity 
and an assertion of their political rights and an assertion of what is called black identity or African Afro-American identity. I was also thinking of uh, you know how Langston Hughes narrativized uh, in his poem Harlem, one of the major iconic African-American writers, a playwright, uh, but one of his poems, uh, Harlem, or A Dream Deferred, where he uses the metaphor, a raisin in the sun. He talks about the African-American dreams as a dream deferred. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sow and then run? Uh, and this theme was later, you know, uh, developed by Lorraine Hansberry in uh, you know, uh, the title of Lorraine Hansberry's work, A Raisin in the Sun. So some of these uh, metaphors that writers have used, it says a lot about uh, you know, what uh, African-Americans have been through uh, in white America. My approach to uh, uh, race, you know, how I understood it as a student of literature, was looking at uh, the caste system in India. I always, you know, uh, kind of link that uh, to understand these hierarchical notions of power and uh, who controlled resources or, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and I want to discuss here a very interesting article that I saw in New York Times published on 25 May 2020 in the post George Floyd context. And it is titled America's Enduring Caste System. And uh, the author uh, actually connects it, uh, you know, to uh, in certain ways to the lingering millennial long caste system in India. And uh, uh, she doesn't say it's synonymous, but she says they are not mutually exclusive either. And uh, uh, the, the race-based caste pyramid in the U.S. So uh, this writer looks at uh, race as you know uh, the uh, yeah, it's, a, it's seen in terms of hierarchy of caste and power. And uh, she says that if caste is the bones, then race is the skin. And uh, how in America, African-American community have been born into a silent warging, which is centuries old. Caste is deep but ra and rigid, but race has been fluid. And a uh, very interesting anecdote that the writer uh, talks about in this incident is when Martin Luther King uh, and his wife Coretta went to visit Mo Mohandas Gandhi uh, in Mumbai. They were also able to meet up with the uh, Indian, you know, Prime Minister, and uh, they also happened to go to uh, Trivandrum, where they visited a school, a high school, and the students were children of untouchables. And uh, Martin Luther King was actually. Uh, introduced to those uh, young people as uh, the school principal actually went up to the microphone and said, I would like to present to you a fellow untouchable from the USA. And uh, Martin Luther King was seized. And uh, actually, it was at that moment, that point that set him thinking that it actually was true that he was thinking of 20 million, uh, you know, African Americans in the US. And uh, the author also says that that was what led to this awakening and his speech, the I have uh, a dream, uh, which was, you know, presented at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in 1965. Uh, yeah. And uh, it is difficult to sum up all of uh, these voices uh, uh, in a few minutes. And uh, yeah. So I would like to. Uh, give the floor to Professor Aragarsan on this, and I'll stop on this note. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Gita. You raised uh, some good points to start. The uh, you referenced Maya Angelou in particular, and I would just note that uh, at the consulate we're working on a project to have some of Maya Angelou's poetry and the book you mentioned. I know why the caged bird sings. We're going to try to have that translated into Tamil to have a, a wider readership for Maya Angelou in South India. That's a project we're working on. It's not come to fruition yet, but it's something we're interested in. You also referenced the 1959 visit to Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, when he visited India. Uh, he was here for a month in 1959 exactly to 
learn about the nonviolent ideals espoused by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. And you're exactly right that that later um, informed the civil rights movement. And I think that might be a good segue to Dr. Alagarasan, who in particular, I believe, has an interest in uh, the Indian uh, foundational figure, Dr. Ambedkar. And uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Alagarasan. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, sir, you're on mute. Please unmute your microphone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Maulik. Uh, thank you, Dr. Geeta, Dr. Manju. Uh, mine will be mostly uh, personal reflections on how uh, I understand American, uh, the national debates on national identity in the American context and how it helped uh, reshape our thinking in the national and local context. Uh, first, let me just talk about my uh, entry into research. Uh, when I was doing research, I was given three times uh, American research grant uh, offered at the uh, American Research Center at Hyderabad. And all the three times I spoke, uh, I worked only on Tamil uh, folk culture. Once I spoke about uh, lullabies and the other times I spoke about uh, Tamil folk traditions uh, like Villupattu and Terukuthu. Uh, so, uh, but I was uh, wondering how uh, some of my colleagues uh, who uh, worked on American studies did not uh, get their fellowship. Okay, then uh, that I think was a major revelation for me that uh, uh, American studies was not, not limited to studying uh, American literature. Uh, I think the methodological uh, dimension is also very important and that's why I was able to get the grant. Uh, then second important aspect was that uh, 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 the former Council General uh, uh, Tom Gradisher, uh, 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 he was interested in learning uh, several languages and there was a Tamil tutor for him. And when the Tamil, Tamil tutor went to Delhi, uh, I was asked to take Tamil classes for him. So I took uh, some uh, four or five weeks Tamil class for him and that was a nice experience. And at the end of uh, my session, he also gifted me a book. Uh, uh, religion and politics in the United States. So uh, my reading uh, of that book was uh, not from an academic context, but uh, I re personally could relate uh, with the book and the ideas. And, uh, and the book in particular was not uh, serious academic work and it, was, it also carries the voice of a bureaucrat. So uh, that, uh, that way I think I was able to uh, move beyond the uh, academic uh, boundaries of understanding American studies. So with this brief note, I think I can uh, just talk about how um, I got exposed to the issue of uh, uh, national identity. Uh, I was doing my research in the period 1991 and 94, in three years. And uh, during the period, uh, I was exposed to uh, the break of the Berlin Wall in 89 and then uh, the collapse of USSR in 1991. And uh, this created a major uh, uh, debate on nationalism and national identity in the Tamil intellectual circle. So uh, there were translations of uh, uh, works uh, written by Benedict Anderson uh, from Cornell University uh, about national identity. Uh, and there was also a lot of debates taken up about what constitutes a nation. The, so uh, I think, uh, see, whatever I read about uh, American literature or American writers, including Maya Angelou, Ali, Alice Walker, or Benedict Anderson, Benedict Anderson, I was reading everything in Tamil. So I think that uh, gave me uh, an in-depth understanding of uh, uh, not only American studies, but also the way uh, the local intellectuals uh, managed to relate uh, something that is foreign uh, to a different cultural context. Uh, so. Uh, then, uh, in the year 1991, I also witnessed the rise of uh, uh, privatization and globalization. Uh, that created a lot of uh, debates on the one side. At the same time, I also witnessed how regional literature managed to come to the uh, national scene and also international scene. Frankfurt Book Fair um, the, was completely uh, the face of the Frankfurt Book Fair completely changed with the arrival of regional books in English translation. 
so that time uh, there was a huge debate about what constitutes a nation and uh, there was also a raise of uh, the regional voices and there was a claim for autonomy for regional voices so it was that time uh, the, there was a serious concern about how to understand this raise of regionality uh, which is a serious issue in india right from pre independence time so uh, so when there was a serious debate about uh, this race of uh, regional identity uh, the answer came uh, mainly from two different sources one is uh, uh, it was the time uh, india was celebrating dr ambedkar's 100th centenary uh, birth centenary and uh, there were also translations of ambedkar writings into regional languages so uh, on the other side there was also Uh, and an anxiety to relate this kind of uh, uh, ang- uh, tension between the region and the uh, the nation and the region mm, in the light of uh, uh, american constitution so i think that way uh, ambedkar's writings on constitution and how uh, he uh, defines parliamentary democracy in india as a different form of democracy from american constitution and at the same time he also Uh, gave lot of uh, emphasis on the e- the issue of equality the feature of equality found in uh, american constitution and that has shaped the debate of the uh, uh, dialogue between nation and region in the indian context so the issue that was raised in the uh, 1990s uh, found an answer only in the uh, formation of a pan dalit identity at the national level so on the one side there was a claim for regional identity on the other side there was a possibility of consolidating regional voices under one banner so that was made possible in the uh, uh, pan dalit movement uh, there were scholars from other parts of india there were dalit intellectuals from other parts of india who were brought uh, to tamil nadu and then there were, they were made to speak in uh, the meetings organized by dalit movement i think that was a major revelation for me again uh, uh, right from the 1970s when the dalit movement was established in uh, maharashtra uh, american black movement has been a major inspiration so uh, the black panther was almost a model for the dalit panthers uh, which was established in 1972 uh, by namakya dawson in maharashtra then uh, in the 1990s again Uh, the black cultural festival became a model and following black cultural festival in tamil nadu there was annual celebration of dalit cultural festival where people uh, conducted uh, small level of seminars and um, painting exhibition photo exhibition so it, it was a different kind of an ex- experience and uh, following the celebration of black history month in us Uh, dalit intellectuals uh, organized uh, black history the dalit history month every year and it's still going on uh, so uh, right from the beginning the black cultural uh, history has been a major inspiration in the uh, dalit cultural uh, events and the dalit cultural writings also and uh, especially uh, the uh, interest shown on malcolm x was very uh, unique in tamil nadu Uh, during the hey days of uh, dalit movement in the late 90s the life of malcolm x was serialized in a uh, local uh, dalit magazine and the people used to uh, rush to buy this magazine only to read that biography of malcolm x in tamil and later on uh, when the party entered into electoral politics when the dalit party entered into electoral politics uh, the life of malcolm x was published in book form and the uh life of malcolm x was distributed for the party cadres so uh, uh, uh but uh, say i i was also uh, teaching malcolm x in the department of english and at the same time i was also witnessing the way uh, the people and the cadre who belong to the dalit movement uh, received this book uh, so i think these are the these are some of the things which uh, made me uh, understand that uh, the need for dialogue uh, is something Uh, that uh, india has learned uh, uh, not just from uh, american constitution but also from the way uh, black uh, culture has been dealt in the uh, american intellectual history 
okay so with this uh, brief note i think i can hand over the floor to dr manju thank you well thank you dr alagaras and i'm also learning something here today from our panelists so very interesting uh, you mentioned obviously american studies is more than just uh, literature which is uh, you know an obvious point but i i myself as a, as a literature major when i was an undergraduate I often tend to think of American studies purely in literature, literary terms, but it's it's more than that, as you point out. And you mentioned the Constitution, and just as a point of interest, I would also note that uh, last year the consulate organized a series of debates for Indian uh, undergraduate students. You may know about this. It was throughout South India. We called it the Comparative Constitutional Debate, and we involved both American and Indian scholars to talk about our respective constitutions. And as I'm sure you're well aware, there's some mutually reinforcing, um, you know, inspiration going both ways on that. So, anyway, thank you for those remarks, Dr. Alagarasan. We'll move now to um, Dr. Manju Kumari. She's joining us, as I said, from Coimbatore. And uh, I believe she'll be talking about uh, multicultural aspects of uh, the literary genre. So over to you, Dr. Manju. Thanks for joining us from Coimbatore. Thank you, Mr. Maulik, and greetings to my co-panelists. I would be talking about the multiculturalism, particularly with the novels. Let me begin with the words of a novelist, a poet, and a writer, D. H. Melhem. He says, literature is a part of culture and culture is a meeting place. We meet, we must care where people come from in order to respect the fact that they have origins. This is a great pleasure in diversity, I unquote. American literature has inherited a rich tradition of storytelling from the members of the family and surroundings orally for centuries. America's colonial linkage with England has left its mark in almost all works which were written by the English writers. However, American literature has its characteristics and the breadth of its production is considered as separate path and a separate tradition. Like other national literatures, American literature was shaped by its history and the country it produced it. This encouraged multicultural writings to surface in American literature. Multicultural literature became a major source in insight of this rich cultural dynamics of American society, a medium to comprehend the nation's rich cultural heritage and to show the ethnic diversity in American experience. Ultimately, the power of this multicultural literature affects everyone because literature defines the true essence of soul and um, uh, love of the country. So how can one define the term multicultural or multi-ethnic writings? Earlier, it was explained by the terms of red, black, white. But slowly, when we stepped into the 19th century, where slavery was highlighted, the focus narrowed to black and white. So there was a lot of numerous multicultural writers uh, in, the diverse, uh, in the diversity of American literature, like novelists, playwrights, poets, and all their roots were also in a diverse form, like the Caribbean, the Mexico, Indian, Korean, uh, Black American, Native American, Pakistan, Vietnam, and so many. Therefore, these stories, told from these multicultural writings are told from different points of view. And these American uh, authors being from a multitude of ba backgrounds, they built bridges of understanding over across the nation, America, which could be understood by each other or each other's world, which is apt for today's discussion, one face, many voices. In the years uh, towards the close of the 18th century, novels uh, of uh, some historical importance were produced and they came the first uh, novel in uh, America. And probably after the American Revolution, many American writers produced American uh, literature with unique aspects of culture and uh, a new literary uh, figures emerged thereafter. 
So narrowing down to the 19th century, American literature took its place among the powers of the world. Its fortunes were so interrelated with the other nations that it uh, inevitably became involved in the two world wars and following these conflicts with the problems of the European and the Asia, uh, East Asia, uh, America set up its print across the world. So uh, the most important discussions of the American culture and identity came from the French immigrants, which also same time saw the birth of American, African American literature and the Native American literature. I would like to uh, parallel these views focusing on two popular American novels in this discussion. One would be uh, Harriet Beecher's uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which we are all familiar with. It is an anti-slavery novel in 1852, which had a profound effect on the attitudes towards African Americans and the slavery in the United States of America. It's a sentimental novel which depicts the reality of slavery, while, also, while it also asserts the Christian uh, love that could overcome something as destructive as enslavement. It views the injustice of slavery pushing back against the dominant cultural beliefs about the physical and the emotional capacities of black people that makes it a leading voice in the anti-slavery movement in America. Now, towards the 20th century, the American novelists were expanding their sp social spectrum uh, to, enc uh, to encompass both the high life and the low life uh, connected to the school of realism. Now, let us take, for instance, the second novel, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, uh, in, the year in the year 1952. Uh, he, the segregation of, uh, was in full effect in many parts of America when The Invisible Man was published, and many scenes were quite shocking at that time. And uh, it is all about a story of a young man, a young college educated black man uh, struggling to survive and succeed in a racially divided society that uh, refuses to see him as a human being. So it was a voice of a black man's search for identity and uh, visibility in the white American society. So ultimately what happens in more, almost all the novels produced by these multicultural writers, they, uh, the, the protagonist realizes that they must create an own identity. So uh, describing a, a, a person's struggle to establish the sense of identity in the uh, American society, here we find Ralph Ellison illustrates a powerful social and a political force to conspire the, and to keep these black uh, Americans um, and to uh, even uh, what to say uh, to grant them uh, the right to life, liberty, and to pursue the happiness which was granted to all the other Americans. So, therefore, I regard uh, this uh, uh, Invisible Man, the novel, which is regarded as a classic of American literature. Uh, it viewed as a lesson that contributes to the understanding of one's own people's culture and history. So like this, there are many works in uh, American literature, especially by uh, focusing on multiculturalism. The novels portray the American society, the life of the people from different cultural groups. And many proponents of the African American literature, Native American literature, Asian American literature, emerged and produced literary works from a long-standing cultural and uh, produced literary works uh, which um, uh, depict the various communities within the nation. So I would like to uh, say, uh, I mean, mention a few uh, Native American writers like uh, you know, Scott Momaday, uh, Leslie Moreau, Lewis Erdrich. They, uh, their works were an explorations of the Native American history and identity. When you take uh, Shish, Jane, Bharti Mukherjee, they are Asian American writers who voice their identity. So uh, I would like to say that these novels are deeply intertwined with the rise of the uh, multicultural approaches based on not only historical, but psychological and sociocultural context, which makes the United States of America experience not only diversified culture and traditions, but also brings a multifaceted sentiments, emotions, identity, voice, and oneness, which is very relevant to today's 
uh, discussion, one face, many voices. Well, thank you, Dr. Manju Kumari, for those remarks. You talked about uh, a wide range of topics, um, the rise of multicultural literature, and also you gave a few um, examples of American novels, Uncle Tom's Cabin and Invisible Man, and then spoke about some um, Native American writers. So thank you very much for those remarks. And again, thanks for joining us from Coimbatore. We try to include a, a, a wide range of audience from South India. Um, speaking of audience, I just want to remind our viewers that you can submit questions. Uh, we have a few questions coming in, but before we move to the Q&A session, uh, we've just finished round one. We've heard from each of our speakers. In the same order that we spoke initially, I'd like to give each of our speakers an opportunity for a quick round two, maybe just a minute or two, if you want to respond to another panelist or if you have something additional to say before we move to the question and answer. So Dr. Gita, back to you for round two. Dr. Gita, please unmute yourself. Thank you. No, you're still on mute, Dr. Gita, I'm sorry. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Malik. Yes, I do have a couple of thoughts that I could share in this forum. And uh, I was thinking of the politics of skin color, and in this context, thinking of, you know, uh, the kind of conversations around Michael Jackson, who uh, with the, you know, like all of us knew that uh, he went for a lot of skin lightening treatment and, uh, you know, he was trying to erase his black identity. And uh, also, uh, I found a lot of younger generation uh, African American uh, women uh, into skin lightening or whitening cream. And uh, I also heard from lawyers uh, because these were, you know, actually dangerous and uh, hazardous to health and there were complications. And these lawyers were saying that there were a number of lawsuits uh, in this regard. And uh, uh, the other thought was uh, uh, also about hair. I was, uh, you know, it was very interesting to see African-American women having Indian hair. Uh, uh, some of them had straightened their hair, the kinky hair, and uh, uh, some had Indian hair. And then I understood that uh, the skin, you know, hair graft was a major, uh, you know, thing in uh, the U.S. And I also understood that uh, in India, in Tirupati, people always tonsure their hair, offer uh, their hair to uh, the God. And uh, that, you know, would be brought to the U.S. And I believe it was a big industry. Uh, so this for me, you know, I wish to, you know, I want to know how my uh, Professor Agarsan or Manju would respond to this, uh, negating with their black identity. Yeah, so that's one thought. Okay, Dr. Gita, thank you. Let's go to Dr. Alagarasan for any thoughts for round two. Uh, yeah, thank you, Molik. Uh, I think I can continue with uh, uh, the, the orientation of my initial speech. Uh, as a scholar working uh, with Tamil writers and uh, doing Tamil research, uh, my interest has always been to uh, understand things outside the academic uh, boundary. Uh, so, uh, as a comparatist, I was uh, when I was looking at the uh, scholars of comparative literature in the US, uh, I was quite thrilled to see that many leading scholars, leading philosophers work in the Department of Comparative Literature and they do not write or they did not write even a single piece on Comparative Literature. See, for example, Derrida uh, worked in the Department of Comparative Literature and Gayatri Spiva, Tori Vishwanathan, Edward Syed, so uh, Paul Diman. So you have a range of uh, intellectuals and philosophers who worked in the Department of Comparative Literature, but they did not write directly about comparative literature. So I kept asking, how did they manage to uh, survive in the department? And how did uh, the American academia uh, accommodate uh, these scholars? Uh, so that gave me an answer that uh, it is not necessary that uh, one has to uh, uh, produce only 
uh, within one's own discipline and one has to learn the way of relating uh, one's learning i think that that is a uh, big lesson that i have learned from the history of comparative literature uh, then another important issue is uh, 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 dr geeta also spoke about the music uh, but in the uh, history of film music in tamil nadu there are a lot of uh, the film songs adopted uh, from jazz and other uh, blues uh, i think uh, uh, the, uh, i'll say i was quite impressed to see the difference between an academic approach to uh, such black cultural events and the way popular domain has accommodated in the same way uh, if you take the domain of uh, uh, black feminism uh, as you can find in maya angelo or alice walker in us Uh, uh the black feminism played a crucial role in the uh, uh, theorizing of dalit identity in the tamil context uh, of course uh, french feminism also contributed to some extent uh, here uh, the bodily identity and bodily segregation was defined uh, 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 not just in terms of uh, caste discrimination but uh, the definition of caste discrimination was get sharpened uh, by way of reflecting Uh, through the american uh, black and french feminism okay so with this brief note i think i can close this second round thank you dr alagarsan let's move to dr manju kumari for any final thoughts for round 2 yes sir um in in connection with the uh, today's discussion i would like to say that the united states of america stood with really a one phase with many voices which paved way for the multiculturalism by uh, collaborating uh, various ethnic groups with one another without having to sacrifice their particular identities uh, therefore uh, america emerged with a mixed ethnic community where multiple cultural traditions exist so i would say multiculturalism was experienced as a political uh, philosophy in sociology which involves a lot of ideologies and policies uh, which 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 vary widely so american culture itself is a heterogeneous society with a different cultural backgrounds and integrations a fusion of nationalities and ethnicities of immigrants uh, to the united states of america so these multicultural works uh, really are ex- uh, representatives of uh, Uh, american cultural milieu so in that way i would say novels play or uh, rather portray vividly the perspectives in american culture uh, where it strongly makes the nation uh, stand with one face with uh, many voices making remarkable contributions to the american literature thank you okay thank you dr manju kumari uh, we have about a little less than 20 minutes left in our program and i do want to give our panelists time to give brief concluding remarks but let's move to the question and answer section here i'll just choose a few questions and any of our panelists could jump in um, as appropriate here we have a question from m jayashri from pachayappa college for women in kanchipuram uh this person is asking how can you compare black literature with dalit literature and i'll just open the floor to our panelists as you want to respond can i respond yeah uh, see uh, uh, i have been repeatedly saying that there are uh, academic ways of approaching certain things and there are non academic ways of approaching certain things so when you uh, raise this question i understand uh, that uh, you are talking about the way uh, researchers uh, uh, take up a comparative project uh, between the blacks and dalits uh, see uh, there is always a certain there is always a difference uh, between the issue of race and the issue of caste okay uh, during the turban conference in 2001 um, uh, the un uh, uh, um, commission for human rights uh, Uh, they did not include caste as a uh, category of segregation uh, so saying that the race and caste are different so that time there was a pressure 
on the part of the dalit intellectuals to draw comparison between uh, race and caste so that way uh, they managed to include the category of caste in the un charter for human rights so this is a non academic way of comparison so uh, definitely uh, i may not agree with the kind of comparisons taken up as research projects by uh, the scholars uh, at the mphil and ph level but uh, this kind of a non academic comparison i think is very fruitful to Uh, Malik, can I just add a line, a thought? Can I? Yes, just, please. Uh, yeah. please go ahead, Dr. Geeta. Please, thank yeah. you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would just like to continue where Professor Aragarsan left off because he was talking about underlying structures of caste or race, and like he said, you know, they are not synonymous. But yes, uh, you know, they do embody hierarchical notions of power and control, and the dominant uh, group over a subservient group. Uh, I have met uh, Somali scholars because in Somalia, a lot of uh, analysis has been done about clan, again another underlying uh, social structure, and uh, which has its uh, you know uh, origins in a different way. And uh, many of Somali scholars who actually tried to look at uh, clan again through caste or maybe looking at it from a comparative angle. So I thought I could just add that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gita. Uh, so we move now to a second question here. I think this is very interesting. Does multiculturalism in the contemporary context, by the way, this is a question from Professor D. Christina Mary at Loyola College in Chennai. She asks, does multiculturalism in the contemporary times redefine the American dream of success. Maybe I'll look to you, Dr. Manju. I know you've thought a lot about multiculturalism. So again, does multiculturalism in the contemporary times redefine the American dream of success? Yes, the American dream is not only uh, in the 21st century, but it has been right from the origins. Uh, because when we, when we take in uh, the various uh, novels, and uh, when we streamline the themes of it, uh, the American dream begins first. It starts with that. We have a lot of, uh, we have, uh, I have a dream by Martin Luther. We have so many uh, expectations of uh, the American thoughts, which uh, depicts the loss of innocence in few uh, works. We find few works, the coming in a coming of age, the American uh, few works, which speaks about how they are able to flourish. And uh, we have certain um, in our novels, which shows the relationship between nature, science, as well as the society. Then later on, we find um, uh, how we uh, how how we could uh, trace these novelists. Um, we have the themes of alienation and isolation. Then we get the themes of the survival of the fittest in the American society. So I find in every stage or in every century, uh, we have the success of the American writers being portrayed. And in the 21st century, which is uh, the entire world is like a global village. And we find the, uh, these uh, nations, probably like America, we are able to understand and be one with the culture of the others. So probably it is a road to success. That is what I would. Uh, thanks. Dr. Manju Kumari, thank you for that. Uh, here's another question from Naresh Nila Kantan, who asks, uh, I believe a lot of pop and rock culture outfits also voice their opinions through songs in both contexts. Any thoughts on the panelists on the same is highly appreciated. So as I understand this question, it's about uh, music, about songs, also rock and pop music as reflecting uh, this topic of uh, of today's discussion. Any thoughts from our panelists on song or music? Uh, can I? Can I? Please, Dr. Yeah. Alec Garrison, and then we'll go to Dr. Yeah, uh, Gita. See, uh, uh, the reception of uh, uh, American jazz and blues uh, and the 
music in general the black music in general uh, i think goes along with the content uh, so uh, there was an anxiety to trace the african roots on the one side and there was also a self critique of uh, the bourgeois blacks uh, like what you see in bob marley's uh, buffalo soldier okay uh, so uh, i think the black music uh, cannot be separated from the content of the uh, black songs Dr. Geeta and then Dr. Manju. Uh, Malik, I didn't get the question. I, could you repeat it, please? Yeah, uh, Dr. Geeta, the, the mm -hmm. question is about um, music. It's it's saying uh, the the questioner says, I believe a lot of pop and rock mm -hmm. culture outfits also voice their opinions through songs. Any mm -hmm. thoughts on the panelists on the same is highly appreciated. Mm -hmm. So it's basically. As I understand the question, it's asking about the role of music, both pop music and, and rock music, in terms of of this uh, this topic of, of identity. Okay. I sorry, I don't know much about pop okay. and rock music, but that's fine. Uh, like, yeah, like the Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Manju, do you have something on that? Yes, sir. Uh, but I'm not touching upon uh, the pop and the jazz, but I would like to uh, uh, talk about the Native Americans, uh, in particular to the Emperor Jones by Eugene O'Neill. So there you have the beating of the drum, the very beats of the drum signifies the uh, psychological uh, emotions of that particular protagonist. So at every stage, the beating of the drum is equivalent or it has its parallel to the beating of his heart. So the awakening of the consciousness. So this is what is there in the um, Native Americans, uh, which is being portrayed by many playwrights, many novelists to show the significance of music, which is right from their primitives, right from their origins. Uh, can I just uh, say something more to Manju? Uh, I don't know much about pop, uh, what uh, uh, our audience has asked, but uh, jazz, blues, and uh, gospel music, what they call call and response, uh, are inextricably, inextricably linked with the African American cultural identity. And there is extensive literature about jazz uh, in the form of autobiographies. Uh, and uh, a lot of writers themselves have uh, discussed uh, legends uh, like, uh, you know, John Coltrane and Miles Davis and the legendary uh, jazz giant, Jimmy Heath, who passed away very recently. And uh, yeah, also uh, Lang uh, Langston Hughes, again, uh, you know, he uh, uh, wrote jazz poetry and uh, a lot of writers have actually discuss music in their literature. So they are like linked together. They cannot divorce music from literature. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gita. Thank you all for your views on that. Uh, we're getting a few questions about multiculturalism in modern American society or the 21st century. I think we've touched on that a little bit in particular, Dr. Manju Kumari. We, we have just a uh, about seven minutes left in our program. And I think this might be an interesting last question before we move to final remarks. Uh, this is a question from uh, Panmudi Rajamanik Manikam. I'm sorry about the pronunciation there. Um, but this person is asking, as humans, are we doing better compared to a few days back, a few decades back with respect to discrimination? Uh, a few of our panelists touched on issues of race or caste, and this questioner is asking, how are we doing? You know, if we, if we compare back to a few decades ago, are things getting better? Um, Dr. Manju, I saw you un unmute your microphone first. If you'd like to go ahead, I'd like all of our panelists to perhaps address this question, though. Dr. Manju, over to you. Yes, sir. I, uh, I would like to say that it depends on every individual which every individual makes a nation. So uh, when, if, if you're going to say that it is going to be uh, comparatively better or is it uh, getting worse, 
uh, I, I, we can't stand to either of the answer because the uh, earlier when you take it was slavery, then we had the, uh, the industrialization, which has every sector has its own uh, ups and downs. So if you take uh, whether it is a boon or a bane, it is, depends on each individual's consciousness. And uh, I feel every work, literary work, is produced to make a person better through the experience of the characters in the works. That is what I want like to say. I would like to respond to Ponmuri. Is that okay, Malik? Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Gita, and then we'll go to yeah. Dr. Aligarsan. Yeah. Ponmuri was asking, are we doing better? Uh, during the protests that happened, you know, post George Floyd, Floyd's death uh, in Minneapolis, uh, well, you know, it was uh, very obvious that, uh, you know, among the protesters, that there were people of all colors. And my African American colleague was saying that during the civil rights era, that was not the case. They, you know, they wouldn't find, you know, only blacks or African Americans. So here we saw a lot of younger generation and a lot of people of all color. And that I thought, to me, was heartwarming. And uh, the other thought that I had was, uh, I was also thinking of how people want to, you know, represent their own voices. Uh, we're talking about voices here. Like uh, when this uh, book, Catherine Stockett's book, The Health, uh, uh, you know, was uh, filmed, and uh, it was going to be, uh, you know, released in, the, in New York, there was a lot of protest because Catherine uh, Stockett was white and it, the help was, uh, you know, uh, discussing or uh, narrativizing the plight of black women uh, in a racially segregated America. And uh, uh, so when the movie released, there was a whole lot of protest because they said, why can't we write our own stories? So who writes for whom, whose voices should be heard is again another thought that I had. And that I think is very important. And that again takes us to Gayatri, Chakravarti, Spivak, Kemp, Sabalt, and Speak. And uh, yeah, thank you. Shall I? Yeah. Uh, see, in Tamil, there is a saying, huh? many of the Tamil audience will understand. Huh? One step forward, huh? two steps backward. Okay. Uh, I think that will sum up uh, the whole scenario. Uh, so we tend to imagine that because we have new modes of protest, uh, we imagine that we have developed. But things continue to happen the same manner. Uh, the form of uh, oppression doesn't even change. Uh, when I was doing my research in the year 1991, uh, I, the news about Rodney King was widely discussed in the academic and also non-academic fora. Uh, but now we are talking about George Floyd. Uh, that's the only difference. I don't see any difference. I think it is a continuous struggle. And uh, just because we have social media here, just because we are able to file online petitions, uh, uh, sign uh, lakhs of people sign petition, uh, I wonder whether it makes any difference. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Halagarasan. I, I... From my point of view, yeah, it's a long struggle for social justice, but I, I think it's valuable. I'd like, I'm an optimist. I'd like to think things are getting better over time. And certainly in my country right now, there's a lot of dialogue about, about these issues, which I think is, is, is valuable. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. In the same order we started with Dr. Gita, then Dr. Alagarasan and Dr. Manju Kumari. Let's just have quick concluding remarks. Yeah, like I would like to add to what Malik said that there are lots of dialogues now happening and uh, maybe these dialogues will move some social reform and they have, I believe. Uh, I was also thinking of, uh, I don't know if Professor Aragarsan would like to add something to this that about black feminism that, uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, mm. uh, we'll make a transition now to Dr. Alagarasan. Yeah. Because yes. Thank you. Uh, see, I want to clarify two things. Number one, 
uh, from the beginning i have been uh, over emphasizing on the non academic way of responding to uh, many voices in american studies uh, see uh, when i was insisting on the non academic way of responding to things i was only suggesting that when we move outside the academia we get new data and the research also will expand so uh, in a way it is not non academic okay we are only expanding the domain of academics yeah, i just just a clarification number 2 uh, there was uh, always uh, uh, a romantic way of embracing the radical voices from us so when uh, noam chomsky uh, came here to india uh, many people asked questions about caste and other things and uh, the many people raised questions about race and black issues he answered all the questions and finally he said uh, i am able to articulate all these things sitting in us uh, the that is because it is possible in us and you can't speak certain things in india i think that makes all the difference uh, so with this brief note i close thank you okay dr manju kumari please yes i would uh, like to conclude with the quote from a chinese american novelist ha jin who says a uh, multicultural literature is a source of vitality for american culture there is always have been a marginal force that has broadened the mainstream so throughout the history of american literature there is development it flourishes and it enriches literature so diversity is always a good thing it is a source of life and richness and the abundance of culture which makes america a one nation with many voices i would like to conclude saying that well thank you dr manju kumari i would like to conclude by thanking all of our panelists dr geeta ganga dr r alagarasan and dr manju kumari thank you very much also to our viewers who submitted many good questions we didn't get to all of them i would invite you to please tune in again to future virtual programs through the american consulate and our american center and we'll go ahead and sign off for now and hope to see you again soon on a virtual program thank you <laughs>